Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Shu, president of the College of Charleston. There's a quote by Benjamin Franklin that seems appropriate when thinking about sustainability. He says, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. That concept of not appreciating something until it is depleted or completely gone gets to the heart of sustainability as we know it today. In my opinion, understanding the value of something as well as promoting values of overall understanding are what we do in higher education. We help our students to learn that everything is connected. People, business, the environment, each is part of the whole picture. And that applies to our university's liberal arts approach to education as well that all disciplines of learning are linked. We teach that mindset so that our community of scholars is trained in approaching the challenges of the world with an open mind and an open heart. Our faculty and our curriculum reinforce each other by showing that our choices, big and small, have real consequences, both intended and unintended. So what does higher education have to offer when it comes to understanding and affecting climate change? Quite a lot, in fact. Universities serve as a place to raise awareness, and it is through their collective research, experimentation, and teaching that they serve as the intellectual force in helping humanity study and solve problems brought on by climate change. Simply put, the solutions start right here. Universities like the College of Charleston will help shape the workforce, policy making, the necessary innovations, and the next generation's actual understanding of climate change. There are many things that need to be done to combat climate change. Our greatest weapon by far is education, and the College of Charleston will play its part in that fight. Go Cougars! Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Wright, and I'm a professor at the, at the college um, in the psychology department. Um, this event is sponsored by the college's Center for Sustainable Development, which provides students with the opportunities and resources to engage in our community sustainably. At the center and at the college, we define sustainability as the integration of five pillars that make up sustainability, social, economic, environmental, political, and personal systems. Addressing systemic issues with the five pillars equips students with sustainability literacy, giving them the skills and knowledge to tackle 21st century problems. Within the five pillars, there is the specific triple bottom line of sustainability where the three meet. Economic, you may also hear equity, um, environmental and social systems meet and intersect. Sorry, I've got someone who just knocked on my door. <laughs> Um, these systems are necessary in the construction of individual, institutional, and community, and regional and planetary resilience. Along with the triple bottom line, the integration of personal political systems encourages students to approach sustainability from multiple perspectives. This could be encouraging. Hey, sorry, guys. Um, this could be encouraging students to approach sustainability from multiple perspectives. This could be encouraging fellow students and peers to make small adjustments to their daily lives to include more sustainable behaviors and enhancing sustainability literacy by taking sustainability courses that are taught by faculty across the curricula. Through this event, you'll hear various issues that impact the five pillars in some way to help solve 21st century problems and personal actions you can take in your life to do the same. <laughs> 
This event relates to College of Charleston's 2020-2021 Sustain Solves theme of global warming and climate change. We know that global warming will disproportionately impact some populations compared to others and some geographic regions harder than others. This is why climate justice is central to understanding global warming. Given that Charleston's location and future models, we are in a very uh, climate vulnerable community and must work together to adapt to global warming. It is hoped that by viewing this issue through the triple bottom line and the center's five pillars, we'll be able to better advocate for adaptive solutions to climate change. Today's Climate Friday event, focusing on utopic and dystopic climate futures, will explore the concept of hope and how hope may or may not help us to imaginatively influence our social, economic, political, personal, environmental systems to positively address a climate impacted future. Um, this event is going to be, we, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Claire Curtis from the po Political Science Department joining us today. Um, she's a professor of political science at the College of Charleston and has taught a variety of courses at the college for the last 20 years. She's an author of post-apocalyptic fiction and the social contract, We Will Not Go Home Again, um, and the co-editor of a special issue of Utopian Studies dedicated to Octavia Butler. She's published articles on Ursula Le Guin, Octavia Butler, and contemporary young adult post-apocalyptic fiction. Most recently, she published Standards of Justice for Human Being and Doing in Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312 and C.S. Friedman's This Alien Shore. And The Politics of Living Together, Butler Short Stories and Teaching Political Philosophy and Approaches to Teaching the Works of Octavia Butler, um, edited by uh, uh, Tarisha Stanley. Currently, she's writing a book on Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach and contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction. As a political philosopher, she uses fiction as the experimental shape, um, sorry, she uses fiction as the experimental space of living together to analyze theories of justice. She teaches courses in the history of, of political thought, utopia and dystopia, and the contemporary intersections of gender, theory, and law and she lives here with us in Charleston, South Carolina. So throughout her talk, if you have any questions about uh, uh, for clarification or things that you'd like to explore in the Q&A, please just put them in the chat and we will bring them up at the end. And I am now going to turn things over to Claire. Sorry for the chaos at the beginning. Claire, take it over. Claire, you're muted. Okay. I had, to un yeah. I had to stop my share to stop the mute. So that's a great way to start. So here we are. Let me get back into what I am sharing and back into what we're talking about today. Hello all, thanks so much, Jen. Um, and thank you, Todd and the Center for Sustainability and um, all that we're doing on campus around sustainability. I've had the uh, privilege of being one of the people involved in teaching a class this last semester, Utopia Dystopia, and this semester in FYE on sustainability issues and just working with all the people on campus talking about sustainability is always really exciting. So a little outline for what I'm going to be talking about today. It comes in four parts. My hope is to talk for um, really no more than 40 minutes to give people a chance to, for us to have some conversation around this. Um, so I'm gonna talk some a little bit generally about hope and the reason why I think fiction matters. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the kind of fiction that I'm interested in, utopia and dystopia um, and thinking, and this is, might be a place where people have questions about sort of fear narratives versus hope narratives. Um, that's becoming a kind of a little bit more of an open question of debate among utopian studies scholars. Um, is this question about fear narratives versus hope narratives. I'm gonna be talking specifically about three examples um, from Octavia Butler, Kim Stanley Robinson and Vandana Singh, and then just end with a little bit of discussion about our imagining different futures. All right, um, okay, well, why can't I get it to advance? Hmm, hmm, who has a thought about that? Okay, figured it out. All right, so what do we mean when it is that when we talk about hope? And I think, you know, one of the things about thinking about hope is that we often push together as synonyms things that really should be separated, right? So what's the distinction between thinking about hope, thinking about optimism, thinking about wishful thinking, 
being naive, being a Pollyanna, all of this. And so what I want to focus on with hope is that hope is active and not passive. Hope usually requires action. So for example, if you think to yourself, oh, I really hope I do well on that test that I have next week, and then you do nothing to um, facilitate your doing well on the test between now and next week, I'm going to say you actually haven't accurately used the term hope. Maybe you've wished that you would do well, but hope requires this kind of action. Um, and then finally, hope is always about the future. Um, and that's one of the things I'm particularly interested in. Okay, so when we think about hope, how should we think about the role that these fictional narratives might play? And one of the ways that I think about this, and Jen alluded to this in her uh, very kind introduction, um, is this idea of what I'm going to call the how of hope, or for what I do as a political philosopher who reads a lot of fiction, um, where fiction becomes this experimental space. Um, if you're a political philosopher, you can't, I can't, like some of my colleagues who do empirical work, I can't actually make the experiment, um, but I actually don't need to because that's what fiction writers are doing, is that they're creating these spaces, these fictional spaces where characters are um, living through, working out, working among one another under certain sets of conditions. Um, and not in all of those narratives, but in some of those narratives, this question of hope becomes really central. Um, and where you can see this hope uh, becoming particularly central are the kinds of fictions that I'm particularly interested in, which are utopian and dystopian fictions. And so I want to just kind of clarify with some pretty basic terms that I'll be talking about so that we're all on the same page. So utopia uh, is a term that was made up, that was coined by Sir Thomas More in 1516, when he wrote an essay that has a very, very long name, but that everyone refers to as More's Utopia. And when he made up the term, what he was thinking about is a word that was going to do two things. Um, we think of utopia as a good place. And that's one of the things it does with this first that eutopia. And eu is the prefix meaning good. If you think about something like euthanasia, meaning good death, utopia is a good place. But the u prefix in utopia means um, not or nowhere. So this idea that utopia from the very moment that more um, coins the term describes a good place that is no place. Now, when I say that Moore coins the term utopia, Moore is certainly not the first utopian writer. Um, and in fact, we have uh, in, in really all traditions, there are utopian ideas and ideals. Um, what Moore does is he just labels it and gives it a particular name. Dystopia is considered utopia's um, kind of companion. I don't necessarily want to say it's opposite, but it's companion understood to be a bad place. Um, climate fiction is not necessarily always um, a part of this utopian and dystopian tradition. And at the very end, I'm gonna have a list of um, novels that I'm interested in. And I might say a little bit there about some of these are not necessarily within this utopian and dystopian tradition. Um, and so climate fiction, which some people will now refer to just as cli-fi, right? Fictional imaginations in a world of a changing climate. Um, Post-apocalyptic fiction, which is one of my particular interests, um, which is uh, fictional narratives after or sometimes during and then after some sort of um, a catastrophic event. And so, for example, in the 20th century, um, during the Cold War, there are a number of post-apocalyptic imaginings following um, nuclear exchanges, things like this. So there is this question, is all climate fiction then dystopian because the climate is changing and it's clearly bad? And is it always post-apocalyptic? And I think it's important to see from the start that that's not the case. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why it's not the case. And, and part of what's interesting about this, again, for people who study utopia and dystopia is that a lot of the climate fiction stuff, there's been a, a real kind of surge in climate fiction in the last 10 years. And, and how to map on these various genres together is something that those of us who study utopia and dystopia, and then people coming from other um, kind of fields of study are, are still working through. So 
what I want to emphasize are these last two terms. Um, and these are terms that are used by uh, scholars of utopia. They come from a scholar named Tom Moylan. And what he is interested in is identifying what he calls critical utopias and critical dystopias. Um, and what each of those has to do with is setting up either their utopian or their dystopian space. So a novel that would set up a utopian or a dystopian space, but they're critical in the sense that the critical utopia always includes a certain kind of questioning, whether among the characters or among the circumstances about the very nature of the utopia that's being presented. And then the critical dystopia, and this is really, I think the category that's most interesting for thinking about climate fiction, the critical dystopia, which while presenting this classic kind of bad space includes within that presentation, um, the possibility of something else. And this is where I think the idea of hope comes in, because one of the ways in which scholars identify thinking about critical dystopia as against what we might call classic or ordinary or typical dystopia is in a typical dystopia, there's no hope in the text, but the hope has to come from the reader of the text. And so you as a reader are thinking, I want this world that's being posited in my future not to come to be. And so maybe I will now act to keep that future from coming. What critical dystopia does is it includes that hope, that piece of hope from the reader, but there's also hope in the text itself. Um, and so there are moments in the text where you can see characters acting in such a way um, where they might bring about a better world and unlike in the classical dystopias, in the critical dystopias, those characters are not just crushed with that classic boot stomping on your face at every moment, right? Those characters are seen to be potentially successful. All right, last bit about kind of um, terms and ideas. Um, so people who study utopia think that utopia matters um, for a couple of different reasons. And I think of all of these as um, what I might call hope adjacent, right? These are all hope related ideas. So one is this notion of what's called the education of desire. This idea that what a utopia can do is it can get a reader to learn to desire differently. So by being presented with um, rich descriptions of radically better worlds, I might learn to desire differently and in some sense desire better. So um, I will both exercise my capacity for desiring, but I will also substantively fill out some real kind of content about what a better future might be. And obviously, and if people are interested in this, we can talk about this. The term better is um, potentially loaded uh, for many people. So I want people to kind of think about that notion of the education of desire. Secondly, um, utopia is just like dystopia, always seen as a critique of the author's own present, right? So this is the idea that when I'm imagining or presenting or positing some radically better vision, the reason why I'm doing that is I'm critiquing my own particular present. Um, as I just noted, the utopia is the imagination of this radically better future. One of the reasons I'll continually try and use this phrase radically better than just utopian is I think in our ordinary language, we have a tendency to use the term utopian as a very dismissive term, right? Once it's utopian, it's then, it's out of, um, it's out of the realm of possibility. It's just wishful thinking um, that is somehow then no longer even about hope because it's just, it's that no place rather than it being the good place. And then finally, utopian um, scholars are very interested in this idea of utopia's method. And part of what that means is that it's not just the fact of a utopian imagining a utopian novel, but it's this idea that the process of reading that novel, of thinking about that novel, of talking about that novel with other other people creates this sort of method. And I think hope really sort of captures part of the doing of that method um, of thinking about these radically better worlds. And so one other way of thinking about this is reading utopia, thinking about utopia, thinking about these hopeful um, fictional accounts is not just escapism, right? It's not just, well, okay, everything is terrible here. So I'm going to plunge myself into this 
um, fictional world and escape to a different place. One interesting sort of little tangential piece about this, I was just at a, a conference on Zoom um, la a couple of weeks ago, and there was an interesting discussion around um, the tensions between fantasy and science fiction, and it was someone who studies fantasy, and he was very kind of finger wagging, taking people to task on the ways in which this, this method of utopia can be present in fantasy, where often there is a sort of um, favoring of those imaginings that are rooted in reality, which is often the utopian science fiction um, uh, imagining. Uh, so if people are interested in that, we can talk about that um, later. All right. So my three examples that I want to talk about today. Um, the first is Octavia Butler. And as Jen noted, I've um, written and kind of thought about Butler a lot in my career. Um, and I think Butler is really interesting for a number of different reasons. So first, if you don't know anything about her, she's a very prolific science fiction writer. I've, I've just given you three. Um, but she's written far more than that. She is a um, uh, multiple award winner in the Hugo and the Nebula, which are the science fiction awards. She's a MacArthur Genius Grant winner. Um, she died very young in, well, what I will say very young in her um, 50s. Uh, and one of the things that I think is useful for thinking about Butler and Hope is um, also goes to another field, which I'm just going to kind of mention. And again, we can talk about it at the end. But Butler as an Afrofuturist writer. So Butler as somebody, as a woman of color who wants to imagine science fiction futures that include people of color. And part of this is right, she's writing initially um, when she's first writing in the kind of 60s and 70s where science fiction tended to be a very white space and a very male space and a very colonizing space. Um, that part of what she's doing is trying to imagine different kinds of writings. Um, and the piece that I'm gonna be talking about is uh, the one up here, the upper left middle, I don't know, Parable of the Sower. So Parable of the Sower is written in 1993. Um, and imagines a very particular kind of world. And what I want to first start with is an interview um, with Butler about Parable, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about Parable itself. Um, so I can't talk about Butler without also mentioning our own um, Consuela Francis, who wrote a, um, who edited a collection of interviews with Butler and this second passage here of just thinking about what Butler is doing and particularly in terms of thinking about this idea of hope where um, uh, Consuela notes, Butler holds up a mirror reflecting back to us what is beautiful and corrupt and worthwhile and damning about the world we live in. And while her vision is often dark and violent, it is also always hopeful. Um, and this idea of uh, Butler's hopeful visions in the midst of the dark and violent, I think is really important. So when we talk about Butler and the parable of the sower, this is definitely an example of the critical dystopia, um, right? Parable describes a world, um, parable of the sower describes a world set in our own very near future. So published in 1993, but actually set in 2024, a young woman, Lauren Oya Olamina, who is the primary character. She starts at age 15. She lives in a, um, a little suburb outside of Los Angeles in a world where the rain hardly falls. There's a, a rainstorm at one point and she talks about how it hasn't rained in six years. Food is increasingly expensive. They live in a gated community where they're having to protect um, from the outside forces. You see virtually no government presence. Um, there's a brief talk of, of police forces and fire services, both of which you have to pay people. They're not really privatized, but you definitely have to bribe. There's no sense that there's any external world that's helping you. Now, Parable of the Talents, as Butler says in this first quote here, um, is the companion to Parable of the Sower. And I think it's interesting, and this is particularly true for those of you who have read these two books, but she thinks about the relationship between the two novels where Parable of the Sower sets up the problem and Parable of the Talents sets up the solution. Um, and I think what's important for thinking about how she does this is, um, as expressed in this passage, that she wanted to consider some of the solutions, not to propose solutions, 
you understand. What I want to do is to look at some of the solutions that human beings come up with when they are feeling uncertain and frightened as they are now. Um, so first of all, presenting this imagining that she has in the here and now in terms of talking about this novel in 1997. Um, secondly, thinking about just this idea of solutions and what it is that we might mean by a solution. And often people will, again, sort of misunderstand or misread utopia as being about solutions as the language we'll use in utopian studies about this is this idea of utopia's blueprint, right? It's just gonna tell you, this is what you need to do. Follow these steps, woo, better world is gonna come about. And there are certainly examples of what we call blueprint utopias. But Butler's work is not like that and not simply because she's not writing in the utopian trend, but in the dystopian, but also this idea of solutions is not that she's going to try and write out for us, this is how we should do things, but what she is going to do is to give a character who is filled with hope in a variety of ways. Um, so again, Lauren Oya Olamina, she is a young woman of color. Um, she is living in a world that is sort of falling apart around her. And she has this idea of hope, of what I'm gonna call kind of hope in preparation. So that part of what she does as a character is kind of two related things. One is this interest in preparation of how do you live in a world that is falling apart? And so the ways in which she um, is always prepared to leave her community in with this thought that things might fall apart. So she has a grab and go pack. Um, and it's something that you might think of as, you know, when we do hurricane preparedness, what are you supposed to keep in your car? What are you supposed to, to sort of keep on hand? But part of what's interesting about her grab and go pack is this preparedness is not just, oh, I need food, I need water, I need a blanket to sleep in, a change of clothes, some extra shoes in a world where shoes are very expensive. Um, but she also, she needs knowledge. She's very interested in looking at what she calls the maps of her um, grandparents of this area in California and sort of how you might get from place to place. And she packs seeds is the sort of the seeds as being the classic um, literal and metaphoric vision of hope. Um, this idea that when she leaves, she's going to bring these seeds with her because she's going to be starting over and starting anew. So that's the first part about, about Butler, about Lauren as a sort of um, hopeful in preparation. But the second important part about Lauren as hopeful in preparation in terms of, of this novel is this worldview that um, Lauren has, this religion that she, and, and there's tension in the text about this, that she doesn't invent, but she discovers called Earthseed. And these three ideas, these are the sort of three central ideas of Earthseed, the notion that God is change, that we are, our job as humans is to shape God, um, and that Earthseed, the destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars, is to leave Earth and to find some better space someplace else. Um, the imagining of this idea of Earthseed and what it's doing is um, plays out in Parable of the Sower, in Parable of the Talents, and then um, Butler dies prior to the publication and even the completion of the third of these, which was to be called Parable of the Trickster, and then there was going to be another after that. Um, uh, Parable of the Trickster um, was the book that was going to take place after they left Earth. And so what we have is in Parable of the Sorber and Parable of the Talents is those moments prior to leaving Earth. And one of the ways in which um, Lauren herself thinks about what she's doing, you can see in this um, longer quote that I have here. So this is Lauren thinking herself, someday when people are able to pay more attention to what I say than to how old I am, remember she starts at age 15, I'll use these verses, these earth seed verses, to pry them loose from the rotting past and maybe push them into saving themselves and building a future that makes sense. Um, and again, like to, to express that there is hope in this passage, Right, I mean, that hardly scratches at the surface of what's going on in the passage. Um, one of the hopeful pieces that's connected to this idea of um, preparation that I think is interesting, and this is gonna come up in the other examples that I talk about as well, is when we think what we're um, 
what are we working against? And one of the pieces that we're working against that Lauren as a character is very clear about here is the ways in which we, um, many people are waiting for things. And you hear this a lot in the um, sort of the current times we're in and the coronavirus times is waiting for things to get back to normal. And there's a lot of parable of the sower of characters, particularly older characters saying, yes, things are very bad now, you're so right, but things are going to go back to normal. So number one, things will go back to normal. And number two, other people, right, they, whoever the they is, they will fix things. And Lauren herself, right, that's this prying people loose from the rotting past, right? What we need to do is to not think about the normal, not think about somebody else coming in to save us, but we ourselves need to prepare for a different kind of future to build a future that makes sense. So that's my Butler example. I'm going to move very quickly on to a second example of an author that I'm really interested in, Kim Stanley Robinson, also um, enormously prolific, um, also uh, a, a multiple award winner in the Hugo and the Nebula. Um, he also in 2018 won the Arcee's Arthur C. Clarke Award for, and I wanted to mention this just because I like the name of this award, for imagination in service to society. Um, and really one of the things that's interesting about Robinson is that he is very, um, very self-conscious about what he is doing. He is actively trying to put his imagination in service to society. Um, and he will talk very specifically about the ways in which utopia really is the best vehicle for doing this. Um, this gets back to those hope narratives versus the fear narratives. And Robinson's work is almost always in this critical utopian vein. So in the vein of not setting out a blueprint, but of um, setting out radically better ways of living under different imaginings. The three works that I have here, and I'm not gonna talk about them all. Green Earth is the compilation of a trilogy called Science in the Capital. And if you're someone who's, you're like, I don't really read science fiction, that just seems a little off. Read, read Science in the Capital, which is as grounded and like nobody goes to space, um, grounded as possible in our own reality. Um, it's a great trilogy. Pacific Edge, I'll talk about a little bit, it was written in 1990 um, and is part of the California trilogy. All these authors that love the trilogies, um, but the California trilogy and Pacific Edge is the utopian version of that set in Orange County, California in a um, utopian, climate changed future of a very small community and the kind of um, tensions that they have in that community around actually issues of development. Um, and then finally is this, is this book that uh, just recently came out, Ministry for the Future, um, this extraordinarily large book that my FYE students will be reading later in the semester. Um, and part of what Ministry of the Future is interested in is to imagine a United Nations that establishes a ministry for the future, that establishes um, an actual body within the UN whose job it is to advocate for people in the future. And Robinson himself in many interviews talks about the ways in which, um, first of all, we need to learn to value better um, those in the future, number one. Um, and that number two, when we think about valuing those in the future, we have to kind of remember what it is that we're doing, right? Remember what it is that should be motivating us ultimately into this. And so this is, and, and Robinson, if you're interested in these issues, Robinson is a great place to start. His novels are very big, but his um, groundedness in science, his groundedness in what it is that we do. And in an interview recently, he talked about um, the ways in which, look, we have the technology to make the changes. He argues that, right, the physics, right, where we are now, we can make changes such that, right, we're not past the tipping point. But one of the things he says is our real stumbling block is social. Um, we're sort of the problem. And so he said here in this interview, we need mitigation. We need to fight the political fight. We need a carbon tax. We need everything except giving up. <laughs> 
To say we've lost the battle already is just another science fiction story. It's saying that we will lose. But beyond 2013, this was in 2014, so that's the only reason he's saying that, nothing has happened yet. Path dependency is not the same as inevitability. People are way too chicken when faced with the supposed massive entrenchment of capitalism. It's just a system of laws, and we change laws all the time. Um, and I think what's interesting here is, right, Robinson is not necessarily saying something that we don't already know, but he's very good at putting those things that we do already know into words and then into characters and into stories and into potential futures that can allow us to sort of think through what this might mean. So the two um, works, but really I'm just kind of going to talk just specifically about these two passages. Um, what's interesting about Robinson kind of from an uh, from the perspective of what I do in my own work, right? So my perspective as a scholar is that Robinson himself is really deeply entwined with the utopian studies community, with academics. He worked to get a PhD in English, right? He reads all of the same works that sort of we do as academics who write about this. But Beyond that, he also spends so much of his writing and thinking to make sure, and this gets back a little bit to that science fiction fantasy tension, to make sure that everything he's writing is grounded in what it is that we can do, have done, really think about. And what these two passages do is in Pacific Edge, you can see this version of this, what I'm calling this groundedness, um, just in terms of thinking about utopia itself. So again, Pacific Edge is a utopian community in this area in Orange County, California. It's a book that involves a lot of softball games um, and people who, you know, people always say, isn't utopia super boring because everybody would be happy. It's like, no, the people aren't particularly happy. Like there's like, People don't date the people that they want to date, and there's this development fight, and there's political fights, but what they do do is they work together for the good of the community in a way that's not naive, that's not Pollyannish, but it's just how people should be working together. But one of the characters in that novel is thinking about the idea of utopia and says this thing, right, and this is what utopian scholars are always interested in, it isn't the perfect end product of our wishes. Define it so, and it deserves the scorn of those who sneer when they see the word. No, utopia is the process of making a better world, the name for one path history can take, a dynamic, tumultuous, agonizing process with no end, struggle forever. And right, this is not Robinson speaking in an interview. This is the voice of a character in one of his novels, getting a reader to think about the idea of utopia because ordinary readers aren't, and there's no reason why they should be, out reading utopian scholarship. So that's one way of the groundedness. A more sort of grounded way of the groundedness is in this novel, Ministry for the Future, which I believe some people may out there in, I don't know who's on the Zoom, may have read, but Ministry for the Future is the most expansive and almost exhaustive discussion of a novel set in a changing climate because it includes um, technological innovations, economic innovations, social innovations, political innovations, sort of all of these various things that could be done to radically change the world. Um, through the eyes of two characters, one, the woman who is the head of the Ministry for the Future, and then the other, her kind of um, counterpart, who is an ordinary guy who is stuck under a terrible circumstance in a um, city in India that had a catastrophic heat wave where he is the only survivor. And sort of he is her conscience throughout the novel. So in this passage, she's talking about having just had this enormous meeting with um, central bankers from countries from around the world, and they're trying to get the central bank to um, make a carbon coin to essentially monetize removing carbon from uh, the atmosphere. And they do it, right? So there's a su success. And then, then this is what she says. Then nothing happened. And yet there were still people fighting tooth and claw. And it could be that it was only in the realm of the social that they were so far behind the curve of the moment. Anyway, people were fighting, although not just for the good, but also against the good, fighting tooth and claw to forestall their efforts to hamstring them. And this is where I wanna come back to this idea again of hope and um, 
Pollyannish and being optimistic and the ways in which hope recognizes two things here. Number one is this acting towards future generations, right? This is a crucial part. Part of what this novel is trying to do is to put into our own heads, our own potential future and trying to get us to feel not just empathic towards those characters in that future, but wanting to act towards that future. But also, right, the novel is very clear that there are going to be those working against that vision. That's equally true in the parable um, accounts. It's going to be equally true in the next example that I give, right? So there are always people who are potentially working against you. And I think there's a notion in this, in this realm of thinking about hope where you want to always be aware, right? Yes, I am acting towards a future that I think will be better for the people who will get to live in that future, but that there are those who are working against that as well. Um, and so that piece of people working against is also a crucial part for Robinson of the ways that he sets out these imaginings. And I think part of that goes back to why he thinks the social is so important. All right, on to my third example. And I will say I actually did not know about Vandana Singh and her writing until I was preparing for this FYE. Um, and I'm so glad that I did because her writing is incredibly interesting. So she is a physicist at Framingham State um, University in Boston and a science fiction writer. And she is both, she is Indian. She um, came to the United States for her graduate degree and is currently chair of the physics department um, at Framingham State, but is also kind of the way she describes it is she does physics and teaching during the school year and in the summer she writes science fiction. Um, and in her own thinking and writing about science fiction, she too write as all science fiction, I think writers do become sort of embedded in the world of people who write science fiction. And she wrote on her blog a piece about Ursula Le Guin um, and the ways in which, uh, so she says she read Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed when she was 30 and that um, what The Dispossessed did is it laid a new universe before me. Um, and that she said, again, of thinking that science fiction was my country too, and realizing this in reading Le Guin. Now that's gonna connect us back to thinking about Butler and Afrofuturism and the importance of having characters in all of these novels that reflect all of the various kinds of people. Um, I think it also shows though the ways in which Singh and Robinson and Butler are highlighting why it is that imagining these futures does powerful work for people. Um, in an interview where she uh, uh, was interviewed by Indra Das, Das says about Singh's own work is that she's asking how we tell stories about saving the world. And that what speculative fiction does is right, you can imagine a different way to be. And, Singh herself in an interview says, uh, you know, if you look at how modern culture has crushed our imaginations, people can't even think of an alternative. They'd rather think of the collapse of humanity than imagine an alternative, which is why I like imaginative fiction so much because it is about alternatives. And so again, what Singh is doing here not unlike Butler, not unlike Robinson, trying to harness the power of the imagination to give people alternatives and the ways in which we're being crushed and, and you know, not just maybe literally crushed in the world, but our imaginations are being crushed. We're being somehow told not to think about possible alternatives. And so this is a long quote from a story that we're going to be reading in the FYA. It's really a novella. Um, and it's a really interesting story about um, these seven people um, who everyone has this uh, kind of Apple Watchy thing this, that they wear on their wrist. But what it does is it has some new technology that connects you basically to random people in the world. Um, and what the story does is, and it kind of has no beginning and no end, right? You could begin the story anywhere and end it anywhere because it's these seven characters who unbeknownst to each of them end up talking to each other at a key moment in each person's life. And each person in the story around the world are involved in various ways of thinking about climate and climate change. Um, 
And so this is one of the characters thinking, uh, describing this thing that he's carrying on his, on his wrist. And he says, on the way here, I stopped at a grassy meadow crisscrossed by streams, a very beautiful place. The reception must have been good because all at once I saw an old woman on my computer screen. She was standing at a kitchen counter feeling like she had nothing to give to the world, helpless, useless, because she was old. So I told her, I didn't know what to tell her because I felt her pain, but finally I told her something cliched, like a fortune teller from a fortune cookie. I said, something good will happen to you today. I don't know if that turned out to be true. I don't even know who she is, only that she's from another country and culture and religion, and I felt her pain like it was my own. And so what you see in the story is in fact, that person, that woman standing at her counter, her grandson had given her this gift and looking at it and seeing a face of a person she does not know, um, knows nothing about, someone say to her, I, something good will happen to you today. And it's not as though that's some like grand eureka moment and she goes out to change the world, but it matters, right? It matters. And she th sort of thinks she doesn't know who this person is. She doesn't know what it means that they said that. But this dilemma that she's having about whether or not she, as an older woman in an assisted living community whose husband has died and her husband had kind of crushed her spirit, um, who wants to get involved in some political activism and feels sort of ridiculous doing it, this becomes a little bit of a push to get more involved. Um, and this is embedded then in this larger story about the ways in which people's voices talking to one another um, compel people towards their work, towards changing um, the world for the better. So it's a really interesting novella weaving these stories together and thinking about hope in what I would consider both the imagination as Singh talked about in that passage of, of sort of the growth in our imagination, but also I think um, the necessary hope and connectedness and seeing how people are connected. Um, moving towards the end of what I wanted to say, uh, really I just wanted to include this passage because I think it is so important for what we're talking about. Um, it does so much involve the power of stories and words and it's about Ursula Le Guin, who is um, one of my favorite science fiction authors. And it connects back again directly to something, one of the things that Kim Stanley Robinson said. And she says, this is at the National Book Award. Some of you may have remembered this when she was given a kind of lifetime achievement in writing award. She says, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words. Um, and I think here, just thinking about the power of these stories to um, enhance our imagination, to push our imagination forward, um, to think about, you know, back to the question that I ask for this talk, does fictional hope count? And I want you to think about that fictional hope in the two ways. Does it matter that there are fictions of hope about our future um, and the ways in which that future might be radically better? Absolutely that matters because that's how we learn to imagine a different future. And that's how when we hope and we act, we're acting towards the possibility of bringing that future into, the, into being. But does fictional hope count in that other sense too, right? It isn't really real hope because it's happening in a story. It's happening in a story that somebody made up. Does that count? And there I think, and back to thinking about um, Le Guin, back to thinking about Singh and the power of stories themselves, stories which are, um, as we know, never neutral, right? These stories themselves matter. They aren't just modes of escapism. They are ways of trying to get people to think really differently about the world in which we live, um, how it is that we exercise and learn to exercise this capacity to imagine different futures, how we learn to care about the fact of those futures and the people who will embody those futures. And a little passage here at the end, we need to learn to act towards a future that we will not enter. Um, I'm gonna leave up here. Uh, I, I will eventually shift over to the slide that tells you what's coming next. So that's gonna be on February 26th, but I'm gonna come back to this if people are just interested in other books and I'm happy to talk about um, any of these books as well, um, but I'm gonna stop there and I wanna hear what people have to say for their questions. <laughs>
Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Claire, for lots and lots to, to think about. Um, our first question, and please, uh, as you're as your processing everything that you've heard, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask, just go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, our first question from Todd Lavasser is, um, what, what might these messages of fictional hope mean or translate for us into our, like translating this into our campus in Charleston, what might it mean for dealing with the inevitable sea level rise and the hotter temperatures that are, that are coming in the years to come? Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. And so somebody else should tell me um, if they know of stories that are specifically set in the low country, number one. Number two, I do know of some of those stories because in my utopia dystopia class, some students chose to write stories and to write stories imagined here. So that's number two. Number three, I think one of the interesting pieces of this is that it's not that it's not necessarily about imagining, although this could be, right? But it's not about imagining, oh, let me write a story imagining like that wall being built and it's so high that Charleston doesn't flood anymore. So, right, oh, there's a hopeful story about a future. And again, life in Charleston just goes on as sort of it would, is that that's not really, I think, the hopeful story that one would write. So, right, I mean, I think one could write the hopeful story around migration, right? People are going to have to leave. Um, one could write a hopeful story around kind of mitigation and, and maybe, I don't know, sort of imagined communities living on abandoned um, container ships, right, which are floating above. Um, but I think the key piece when we think about trying to apply this to the, our own place and where we live is trying to think that what we really need to do is to imagine a different future, not to imagine our present being saved or maintained into the future. And I think that gets back to, again, part of what Jen was saying in the introduction about thinking about sustainability and the five pillars that, right, it's not that we're just thinking about building bigger walls, which for if any of my utopia dystopia students are out there, we're always careful when there are walls being built. Um, but it's about, right, well, how should we change how we live together? How should we change our economic structures? How should we change our political structures? And all of that, right, we are, are in a position now, and anyone who is in college right now is absolutely in a position to be thinking imaginatively about all of those ideas. That, yeah, thank you. Um, I remember being on a, on a conversation with um, Barry Stiefel, who's in the, in the um, uh, preservation department talking a little bit about like when we talk about historic preservation, you know, we often think about preserving the the structures, but the reality is, is there's like this deeper stuff about our culture. Yes, we can be right. And and also he was talking about how, you know, conceiving living on on ships mm -hmm. as one thing that we could be doing. But anyways, um, another question we have is if you're new to reading the genre, which of these books or authors do you would you recommend reading first? So I would start with Butler. And the reason why I would start with Butler is, um, first of all, she, I mean, and this is true of many of these authors, is that she's incredibly prescient. So, right, she's writing those two novels in the 1990s about 2024 and moving forward. And, right, things aren't as bad, although they're they're uh, approaching it. Um, but, but anyway, she writes in a way that I think is, um, her characters are very approachable. The scenarios are very um, realistic, right? You can see this as a future world. Um, I will say that she's probably the grimmest novel. I mean, back to what Consuelo was saying, her visions are often really dark, but I think there's something, there's, there's a positive to be had in reading the hopeful, hope that comes out of the darkest possible vision. So I'll say that if you are someone for whom like the whole science fiction-y piece seems a little um, off-putting, I will say of the books that I have just listed here on this slide, I would start with the Richard Powers, The Overstory, which isn't even really a science fiction novel, but I think is very much a climate fiction novel of hope. Um, and it's just beautiful, particularly if you love trees. But really, you should start with Butler. Sounds good. So here's another question. Um, it is common to encounter resistance 
to any radical political project on the grounds of feasibility, not necessarily because of material constraints, but because of the challenge of moting people to support major shifts in political commitments, actions, and institutions. So how do you think framing this fiction as political fiction might help overcome the reflexive utophobia, especially in young folks? Yeah, and well, I'm glad that that this asker brought brought up the young people piece, because um, and and the list here does not even begin to address. There's there's a rich um, uh, series of works uh, directed specifically to young people. Of the people on this list, um, particularly Paolo Bacigalupi writes both for young people um, and for adults, and I think there for young people. So there's a traditional story I think that's told about young adult dystopian fiction, which is it, you know, it teaches young people agency and how to fight back against power um, on, in the face of kind of uh, oppression. And that can be very useful. Um, but often what happens there is that you see the sort of the recreation of certain kinds of ways of thinking about power and politics and all of that. And I think the best of these stories, and this is particular stories, this is something Singh is herself really interested in is that you need to, to look for different ways of organizing yourselves, different ways of being together and look to those peoples around the world. And she's particularly interested in indigenous peoples and, and certain, um, uh, uh, it, you know, certain organizations of people in India, but also then around the world of, of, right, we don't all organize ourselves the same way. And one of the things that young people can really do is to try and older people too, because we're all stuck with this is, I think this goes back to the realm of the like back to normal is that we have this image in our head of how things are. Right, and that's why um, Robinson talks about path dependency, right? We have this mental path dependency, like, well, I always did it that way, so presumably that's gonna be the way we do it in the future, is to say like, no, right? Yeah, it's we're more likely to potentially go in that direction if we only think about that direction, but we need to really exercise our minds in terms of thinking about different political ways of being, different social ways of being, different economic ways of being, no less trying to think about mitigations on the more scientific technological side. That's very helpful. <clears throat> so here's another one. It seems that one of the biggest faults in our narratives around climate issues are that they are categorized, how they're categorized in the media, um, that this that these strains of thinking are being processed primarily as speculative fiction rather than serious news insulates us from their realness. Imagine if the news treated climate issues like the coronavirus with 24 seven red alerts. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, how can fiction help us to bring these narratives to serious media outlets that normalize acting with urgency? Yeah, that's such a great question. So. Part of what I sometimes worry about in my own kind of writing and focus on these fictional narratives is precisely that people don't necessarily write, people don't take fictional narratives particularly seriously, right? It is, it is a work of fiction, so why should we take it that seriously? And obviously people who study literature take it seriously, but what does it mean to take it seriously in a sort of a larger sense? Um, so at some level, my answer is, I don't know, but it is a great question. But what I would say is I think two things. One is the more people that start reading these stories, thinking seriously about these stories and talking about these stories, um, you know, that brings with it a kind of um, that, that realm of importance, right? So the more that all of you, all of us can start to consume these kinds of stories and to think about what these kinds of stories mean, the more that we can move forward. The part that I know far less about, um, but I do know there are people who are interested and in, who are working and doing this is, well, what about the somewhat more um, popular for want of a better term, uh, media outlets and stories like this? And here I'm thinking both about kind of uh, movies and television, but even more so around video games. And so in the past, I've had students who've written about kind of the, utopian hope in video gaming. I know really almost nothing about video games, but I would be interested in whether or not, and I don't know the answer to this, right? What is the climate fiction, hope-filled, utop critical utopian 
video game? And is there something that's always problematic because these things get monetized in these ways, but right, is there something in there that might help to get over that obstacle, right? To get people to take stuff more seriously. And so is that is that a better route potentially? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a great question. It is. Great, thank you. Um, so I know we're at time, but one last question just to throw out there for you, just because it's here and I want to I want to hear your thoughts on it. Which of Butler's works from Bloodchild would you compare most to sustainability, if any? And if not, how would you say Butler would go about conveying sustainability and climate change through fiction? Yeah, so it's so interesting because, uh, you know, any of you out there who've taken my Poly 150 class, we read that but Butler, that Bloodchild collection throughout that um, throughout the semester. Um, and I can see why the person said, if any, um, those are works that are, um, it, you know, sometimes you have to work really far, hard to find some hope in a Octavia Butler story. And I think some of those stories, that hope is a little bit harder to find. So in terms of thinking about sustainability in those stories, probably the best one is amnesty. Um, and even there, um, it's going to give you potentially a way of thinking about sustainability, but it's going to be a pretty dark vision about where we might go. Um, I actually think for if you're interested in sustainability and Butler and what works is I would look at the Xenogenesis trilogy, which is also, I think it's now published under the title Lilith's Brood, Dawn, which was the picture I had up as the first novel there. I think that actually has some pretty interesting sustainability. It's about a um, alien species that basically saves humanity from um, uh, our own post-apocalyptic future, but then cleans up the earth and, and repopulates it with people, but we're also living with the aliens. And one of the reasons why I think it connects with thinking about sustainability is it really challenges how it is that we think just simply about what it means to be a human being living on this planet. And in that sense, I think, you know, there's a lot that's maybe not there for thinking about the five pillars, but I think it's probably the best for that radical, like, like, whoo, I never even thought about it this way. So right. it's genesis. Right. And thinking about what it means to be a human being on this planet is certainly something that we should be doing a lot of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, Claire, if you wouldn't mind putting that last slide up, that's Oh yeah, absolutely. Here there will go. be there will be some events happening again. Our next event is going to be um, February twenty sixth, um, and just keep an eye out for us posting these on our um, Sustain at CFC or at at Sustain CFC um, Instagram, also Facebook, um, and our website. And and this video will be posted in YouTube, um, in our YouTube channel once it is done. Um, doing whatever it does in Zoom. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday and we look forward to seeing you again at our next event. Well, thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.